but don't you think that this is the reason on its face to increase oil and gas production and energy production and energy exploration? Yeah. You know, I hope they do increase those things. It does look on a surface level that they uh, are starting to increase those things, especially overseas, like the way that I sort of measure the metric is if it, how well the offshore industry is doing isn't really here in Australia. It's more overseas. And from what I can see, there's more drill ships um, going back to work and more places in like Africa, Brazil, they're all going back to work and they're all drilling again. So that tells the story to me. Uh, once they start building new drill ships again or new vessels again, then it really tells the story. They're not really building them at the moment, but all the ones that were stacked are going back to work. Um, so that can only be a good thing. Um, and it looks like operators are, and day rates are coming back up too. So, you know, we're seeing those 300000 400000 dollars a day, um, which makes it, you know, doable and profitable for uh, oil companies to make some make some holes. <laughs> but in, in the end it was a really good decision and yeah ever like since i was 20 i don't know i've been offshore like 17 18 years now um wow. yeah and it's taken yeah. me from australia to new zealand to africa you know and back to australia again uh, I've been able to live overseas, work overseas. I've been able to live in a caravan and travel around Australia. I have been able to do so many things that a normal job would not allow me to do. So, yeah, it's a – and also someone like me, you know, like I, I'm not an educated guy. I didn't finish school. I dropped out. Uh, I've I've been able from the Navy, like – you know, for someone like me to be able to, like, have the opportunity to work up to where I've got to, earn the money that I've been able to earn, and then also, like, continue on in my career and the potential to earn more and become something more is really up to me, you know? Like, yeah. you can see all these, you know, uh, CEOs of companies or guys running places, they all start, most of them started off rousted about roughnecking, you know? Yeah, mm. very true. No, and and I and I, I don't want to take uh, I don't want to take a counter position to my guest, but I have to I have to take a I have to take objection to something you said, which is not educated. That is very very far from true. I know what you mean, perhaps with a form in a formal classroom setting, mm. but you're one of the most educated people I've ever met. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that, but uh, I I but I appreciate you're oh, making the you. distinction. Absolutely, sir. But I appreciate the distinction because that is something that happens to a lot of people and especially in the oil field. Now, you know that I live in Midland, Texas, in the Permian Basin, mm. and you're currently offshore in Australia. However, um, out here, we, we also live a very similar kind of lifestyle. It's very isolated. Um, there are educational opportunities if one wants to pursue. There's also the military if one wants to pursue. Mm. But for people who grow up in this area, you know, you, you get to a certain point and you look around and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go work in the oil field because you mm. see what it has done for the families around you. Like you say, there is a certain level of economic attainment that normal people don't get. No. But what normal people don't get is that the nature of how difficult the work is. They don't understand that a false move uh, can get you killed. They don't understand that an opened or closed <laughs> valve can be you know, um, like something like in the, the ocean ranger, right? Yeah. Open valves and things like that can topple something tremendous. So mm. we have to be very, very careful. What are some of the, explain to us, and I want to thank you also for being on the oil field leader podcast, because you're my very first guest from offshore. So thank mm. you for that. And second, I want to bring you quote unquote, into the fold, into the family because you are an oil field leader. It's just that your oil field is a couple of miles underwater, but uh -huh. you also work in the oil field. And that is why you are wholly commensurate, uh, absolutely belong on this program. 
um, to discuss some of the items because you also add a perspective that no one else can add. As a driller now for 17 years, um, you've seen a lot, but you've also brought in something personal of you, which is photography. Uh, mm. I want to show some of the amazing photographs that you've taken, but tell me a little, how did you get started in photography? How did, how did that come onto your radar? Yeah, so as soon as we started traveling uh, around Australia, I knew that, um, yeah, I really wanted to, to, to take photos. So, yeah, I just went out and grabbed a whole bunch of camera gear. And as I traveled around, just sort of like started taking photos, you know, taught myself how to take photos. Um, yeah, and I just didn't want to miss any moments, you know, like in time with where we were and obviously with the kids, you know, they're absolutely sick of me pointing a camera in their face and demanding photos. Um, but I hope that, you know, when they're older and they look back on it, then, you know, I have terabytes of footage of, of these guys, you know, skating, surfing, uh, hiking, waterfalls, beaches, you name it, I've got it. And I've kept every single piece of it. I haven't deleted anything. Um, so then I just thought one day you know, I might bring my camera to work because I, I was like, oh, I've got a decent camera. I can take a half decent photo. Uh, I may as well take it to work. Um, I'm also very fortunate that my boss, so my OAM, used to be my driller uh, when I started offshore. So... And I know his feelings on, you know, like rig photos. I know his feelings on rig morale and crew and how important it is. And, um, you know, back in the day, I guess, when I started, it was like super easy just to bring, you could bring a camera out to work and it was all right, you know, and there was, you know, rig photos floating around. Now it's pretty difficult, you know, you have to have a permit and, is it EX proof and there's this all these other barriers but I knew that he would be like if anyone was going to be okay with it it would be him so I just brought it out and then asked him and he said yes and I just fucking started going around and taking photos nice nice and I, I one thing that you said was very particular that not many people would uh would would catch but we do in our industry you said that it had to your camera also had to be EX safe mm. right right and we have the same thing here where we, if you're going to go into a certain space or someplace with, um, where you can't determine the atmosphere, mm -hmm. same thing, headlamps, flashlights, they have to be spark proof because if not, you can ignite. Yeah. And that's so, exactly the same thing on your side, right? Well, yeah. Like obviously my camera isn't EX proof that, you know, I don't even think you can get cameras, good cameras that are EX proof, but so then I just have to, you know, if I want to use it, I, re I have to get a permit and, you, need, you know, I need permission and blah, 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 uh, which isn't, it's fine. It's, you know, it's a half an hour thing, get a permit. It's not a problem. Um, and then, yeah, so the original idea was to just take photos of the crew, you know, and I would just put them up on, we have a share drive at work. And then it was just something that, you know, they could have a semi-decent photo. I just used to edit them a tiny bit. I, you know, there's so many photos that it would be impossible for me to um, give all of these photos the love that they do deserve. But I'll just put like a blanket edit on them so they looked okay. And then I just put them up. And then, yeah, you know, and then people obviously enjoyed it. They wanted more of them. And uh, I enjoyed doing it, and I, and there was something there from you know people really like, uh, yeah, really about happy with being able to share it with their family and show their family this side of it because we take it for granted, you know. We're just like we just work here, and we're like, oh god, it's an old rig, you know, like. But a lot of people are absolutely fascinated and have no idea what you do, and when you show them photos it gives them a, a tiny insight into, you know, this sort of a different world out here. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, but this is, that is also a brilliant segue. Let me, let me share, uh, let me bring on the screen. Let me share uh, some of the photos that we have here. Bear with me as we bring that up. Um, 
because you some of your photographs are absolutely amazing just with, without a doubt. And I want to talk about some of the photos that you have. Mm. And let's talk about some of the people. Can you see that on your screen? Uh, not yet. Okay. I know, just describe the photo. I'll know which one it is. <laughs> yes, it is. It is the one of the gentleman. He looks like he's looking over a blueprint and he is in his red uh, coverall. And he looks like he's using the headlamp on his. Ah, uh, yeah. Hard so time. that is the rig mechanic, and he is fixing a set of uh, BX elevators. And um, yeah, he's going through the drawings because uh, uh, he's having a, a hard time <laughs> chasing lines and chasing the problem. And the funny thing about that was, is I just happened to be walking around the rig at the time. And just snapping a bunch of photos and I just happened to see him there. And for me that one is like all framing, you know, like he's just framed up in the in the cable tray. So that cable tray is for the the BOP crane. And he's just framed up in there and then his headlight is, you know, shining down on his his bit of paper and I managed to snap that shot. He didn't even know I, I took it. And um I didn't even realize that it was, to me, how good it was until I sort of got it back and started flicking through. And, yeah, it was just yeah. – that to me is like that just that perfect moment in time where right place, right time, he's just there. It, he's not posing or anything. He didn't even know I took the photo. And it just – yeah, he, the framing for me is why it's so – why it's, that actually that photo is probably my favorite one. Um and yeah, and then Scotty, yeah. so that, that there's our rig mechanic. So he's like an old, you know, salty guy, been offshore forever. You know, right. he's a bit weathered. He's a mechanic. He's dirty. He's got his headlamp on. He's trying to figure it all out. Just, yeah, it sums up, um, sums up the workplace. Yeah, they're, they're, first of all, all of your photographs are arresting. They're striking. Mm. They are. They are. And uh, and I want to kind of go into the world with you uh, on this one in particular. And no, you can see by the you can see by the the gray chin stubble that he has. Uh, you mm. can see on his knuckles. You can see his hands. Uh, they are they're cut. Uh, you can see where the dirt has kind of all gotten into the knuckles and the wrinkles. Um, you know, this is the kind of dirt that there's no amount of washing is going to take away because mm. this is what's born of, you know, decades of doing this kind of work. And, you know, also he's ready, he's ready to keep working because he's not actually on his knee. His mm. knee is actually up in the air, which means he's just paused for a moment because he's going to get ready to swivel and keep moving on to something else uh, or, you know, keep working on the problem. This is not something he's just, you know, idly reading the Sunday paper. He's like, no, 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 he's, he's on it. Mm. This is amazing. This is a beautiful photograph. This is gorgeous. And do, do you, you want to shout out the name of this gentleman? Yes, his name's if Scotty. You... Um, yeah, Scotty. And he's a, he's a rig mechanic. And the funny thing is, is he's also an avid photographer. So, uh, yeah, he really enjoys that photo. And he started bringing his cameras uh, out to work. He has a lot of old vintage cameras and yeah, mm. this, this hitch, he, he's brought his camera out to work and he's taking photos. So yeah, it's really nice. You know, he, he he's um, getting back into photography and bringing it out to work. And, um, you know, so that's good to see. I really like Scotty. That's awesome. And, and but you see, this is something, this is another theme. Um, this is another very important theme in, in not just for you and for what you do, but in life in general, you know, that. By you doing what you want to do, by you pursuing your interests and what matters to you, you're lighting the fire to other people to allow them to give them permission to follow their pursuits or not to feel bad about it. And that alone is, is a magical thing. So you look at this crusty guy and he's going to start bringing his his cameras because you inspired him to do that. Like that, that's mm. what it's about, brother. It's, it's huge. Mm. Let's take a look at another one. This one 
I mean, man, talk about timing. This one is on the helicopter, or rather, this is of the helicopter, this Airbus, yeah. it looks like. Yeah. And you've got somebody inside and uh and, and they're given they're giving us a symbol here, you know, they're giving us some hands up. Mm. Uh were they coming into land or were they taking off? No, they were going. So those boys um were going home. And uh. yeah, obviously they're very uh, you know, people aren't usually too stoked about coming to work, um, but obviously very happy about going home. So those guys were going home. Um, that guy that is there, you know, giving us is a you know very happy signal. Is my relief. So he's the other driller, and I worked two weeks with him. And yeah, I just um, positioned myself sort of out the back, and I, I saw a perfect place where I could um, stand. And I brought my like I have a really long lens, a hundred to four hundred millimeters. So you know, I was actually quite far away, but just zoomed. I could zoom right in to 400 millimeters and then yeah it just worked out perfectly when they took off the, the, you know the flags they're flapping around and I sort of managed to frame it up and I didn't know that I got them in the window I didn't even know if they knew that I was there or whatever it was but yeah when I got it back and had a closer look I was like oh that is absolutely perfect <laughs> I mean no, no, th th it's, it's beyond perfect. I think that even like in Hollywood, if they wanted to do something like this, they have to CGI it because there's no way that they could ever remotely even get this together if they had paid for it. This is a, a, so beautiful. And I love that you see the vastness of the ocean in this one. You can just hmm. see there's nothing in the distance. Nah, there's nothing. There's around nothing around. in this. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So here's a question. The rig that you're on right now, how mm. far offshore are you from Australia? Uh, yeah, so like we're off a place called Darwin, and we're about 300 nautical miles from land. So it's about an hour and a half chopper ride, which is not too bad. Some places where you could, like, let's just say the, the, the closest you could be is you know, like a 15-minute chopper ride. And the furthest away that I've ever been is um, a three-and-a-half-hour chopper ride, and that involved a fuel stop. And those ones are absolutely brutal. But, yeah, that's really, like, where you could be. But you're in the middle – you're usually in the middle of nowhere, yeah. So, okay, all right. So question born of, of what you just said – it seems already if you have to be flown out 15 minutes and let's say that's even far enough away that from the rig, you can't see the coast. So it's 15 minutes, right? Theoretically, it's the, the shortest flight you could take, but mm. let's edge it to 16, 17, 18 minutes where you just can barely see the coast. Okay. Check. How different is that from like what you're saying? Three and a half hours, like offshore is offshore whether you're 15 minutes away or three hours away, does being three and a half hours away, does that exponentially ratchet up the feeling of loneliness? Uh, I've never thought about it like that. Um, not, not for me personally. I couldn't, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it wouldn't really matter even, even if I was alongside, you know, if, I, if you're away from your family, you're, sort of away from your family that's the way i look at it but um i guess like i i was in the military like i was in the navy so you know we used to do longer trips and further away and have no time off so for me this this job is like perfect but only because i have a different perspective on like i've had a different job so you know the sea has always provided me my work but um you know, in the military, it's like, yeah, you were further away for a longer amount of time for less money and no time off. So this job is absolutely amazing. But the distance from the land to if I feel any more lonely or is it any harder for me to be out here? Not me personally, no. Um, and the distance doesn't really get to me. I don't even really think about it, to be honest. All I'm really thinking about is, oh, it's a like a long chopper ride home, you know, like, or a long chopper ride to work, which, you know, the chopper rides aren't really that comfortable, to be fair. Um, right, of course. But, yeah. No, and you're, I'm sorry. 
no, no, you no like you said, like one, yeah, once you're gone, yeah, once you're gone, you're gone. Once you're away from yeah. your family, you're away from your family. So no, and I get that. Uh, and all of us who who've worked rotations and we've worked away from home, been in man camps, slept in trailers, and sometimes sleeping in trucks, right? Because we're just in locations so remote in the desert that there's it's not even worth driving to a hotel because the second you got there, you'd have to turn around and drive back. So it's not even it's not even worth it. Mm. Um, but I'm sure that for some for some guys it 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 must hit uh, to be even exponentially more removed. But however, but that's something that we all do, and you, especially with your background, are more easily able to absorb something like that. So, uh, yeah. where other people who maybe they only familiar with offshore through their employment, it does ring a little bit different. Let me let me scroll through here and let me let's take a look at another photo. And you know I. I feel, <laughs> I feel so bad because every photo I see, I want to tell you is my favorite one. Um, and it's not for no reason. Like every one of them is, like I say, arresting and compelling in their own way. So mm. this one, we're looking at the Valaris MS-1 rig. Mm. And From are the back we on a boat. ship? Yeah, that's it. So you're on the, yeah. on the back of a boat. Yeah. So what happened there is... Uh, we're going home and the choppers go on strike. So the chopper pilots, they, um, you know, want more money, which is understandable. And the only way to get things done sometimes is to go on strike. I get that. Um, and unfortunately, the day that they decided to go on strike was the day that we were going home. And, oh. the, way, and the way to get people's attention is, you know, not to come pick up the people you're supposed to come pick up. So that's what they did. Um, so then we had to get the boat to take us um, take us back in, which, whatever, no problem. So we basically get Billy Pewed, so um, transferred down to the boat, and then the boat took us in. So I knew as soon as I, I got Billy Pewed down there, I was like, oh, yeah, sweet, I'm going to be able to get some good shots of the rig, you know, like from, from the boat, which is a rare occurrence. Um, so yeah, had my camera ready, went down first, got a bunch of shots of the guys coming down in the Billy Pew. And then as he pulled away from the rig, I just sat at the back of the boat and just snapped away until, you know, I got a perfect angle and I managed to frame up the rig in the back of the boat perfectly. And, uh, yeah, I was, you know, I was super happy with that shot. And the funny thing is, is the captain of that boat um, found me on LinkedIn, found that photo, and then emailed me about it. And he is also an avid photographer. And um, yeah, we 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 Love were uh, we had been chatting. He wasn't happy that about his deck. He seems to think his deck was quite dirty, but he enjoyed the photo. <laughs> Um, yeah, and they're actually alongside us now, uh, doing some anchor work. So I've been taking, oh, that's... I've been taking a bunch of photos. So I've got a bunch of photos of his sheep alongside us doing anchors and, um, I'm going to edit them and send them on to him. But yeah, it's oh, I would love to see those too. That's hilarious. Yeah. I hopefully he cleaned that deck up too. Now <laughs> yeah. you, you mentioned something and I, I sort of had a feeling this might happen and, and here it did. You said Billy Pew. Mm. I don't know what a Billy Pew is. I, now, here, can I take a guess, though, from looking at the photograph? Right? Yeah. I'm going to take a guess. Now, I yeah. zoomed in on the photo, and it seems like right underneath the center part of the superstructure, there seem to be, like, two catwalks or two walkways that probably have ladders or something coming down. Is, mm. Are those the Billy Pews, those little standing areas? No. So, okay. the what you're looking at there, ah, you're looking at the moon pool. So those, the moon what pool. You're, yeah. So that thing in the middle. So you know where the Valara sign is. Yes. Yeah, and then underneath that, you've got those two things that are close to the water. Yes. Yeah, they're called underhull guides, and that there is what we call the moon pool. So, um, basically, that's where we run our uh, pipe through, that's where we run our, more importantly, the BOP through, 
And when mm. we get hooked up to Riser, we'll have Riser uh, in the middle there. So the Billy Pew is actually what we ride, which you can't see, unfortunately. Okay. But you can see the big red crane there. Yes. Yeah, so that lifted us down onto the boat on a Billy Pew. So it's just basically this thing that you just hang on to and then you ride the crane down. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. That's fascinating. Holy mm. cow. And it's funny. And like you say, all of these machinations, because the chopper pilots didn't show up. And like you say, that's certainly one way to get your attention, especially when it's time to leave. Yeah, wow, look. That's incredible. Um, I'm all for people, you know, trying to get more money or fight for their, um, yeah, for what they believe in, I guess. But, you know, it's not, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't all for their cause at the time. I wasn't feeling too charitable about their cause, but I could understand, you know, I could understand why they were doing it. And they did end up getting their raise. So, you know, good for them. And, um, yeah. you know, they, they they definitely don't earn a lot of money. Like if you think wow. that, you know, I would think, oh, yeah, these guys are chopper pilots and they've done all this training and they're, they're landing on this rig and they're, you know, flying us out here. They've got to be on good money. We there's a joke that when they land on the rig, they're the lowest per, they're the lowest paid people on the rig, but they don't get paid a lot. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Oh, oh darn! Yeah, that's pretty bad, right? When you can call it out like that, like you are the least earning person here. Yeah, that's got to be yeah, that's got to be a kick in the nutsack to a degree, yeah. especially when you're doing something that you love. But I guess if you're doing the, if you love being a pilot. You know, then that's the, the glories in, in doing what you want love to do. So yeah. Let me move let me move to this next one here. Okay. Where you have a a cohort colleague compatriot sitting oh, yeah. I'm gonna guess he's sitting in the driller shack and he's, yeah. it's holding his head. Probably mm. looks like he may yeah. even have both hands on his head. No, he just has, he has extraordinarily huge long fingers. Yeah, he's yeah, he's, he's got huge hands fucking huge hands and he's got the phone in the other hand you can just see on his right ah yes you can just see it yeah so what do you think about it oh he has to he has to deliver bad news Mm. or he's receiving bad news Mm. so yeah (laughs) yeah once like yeah he gets a phone call you know big tool pusher on the end of the phone and yeah, just changing up the plan, and it just you know, he's just like, oh god, oh here we go, <laughs> and I just yeah, that one for me is it's, it, it it captures you know what it is, uh, and what you can deal with um, during your day, and it's just real, you know, like that phone rings and you could have this plan, and you know you're working with the boys and you're doing your thing, and then someone you know. You know, usually your supervisor, which our supervisor is the tool pusher, calls up and, you know, everything changes in a heartbeat and you're just like, oh, God. Like, yeah, it can be extremely frustrating. I'm guessing, you know, everyone has a daddy at the end of the day. Everyone has someone to answer to. And, right. um, but, yeah, this is what this was. And I just happened to be taking photos of him. And even when he got off the phone, I, I knew I was like, this plan's changed right. And he's just like, yeah, God. i love that photo yeah Yeah. um and 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 i love it too because and you know i'm so happy that you brought that up i didn't quite catch that phone right there on the Mm. edge and i'm I'm zoomed in on it because yeah it's right there well first of all before i even get into i just want to say again the quality justin justin Mm. my friend justin the quality of this photograph is incredible. I zoomed in and I can see the threads on his jumpsuit. Mm. I can see the threads. Like I, I am there. It might as well be on the chair right behind my monitor. That is how impressive this photograph is. Um, yeah. Thanks to Sony. It, they make amazing it, cameras and more amazing lenses. So, oh, yeah. 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 But where you, but again, it takes the, it takes the sensitivity that you do. So, you know, let me, let me digress for just a half moment. I had a friend um, named Michelle Shepard many, many years ago, and she gave me a book called uh, Expedition. The book, it was a book of, 
and I'm, I'm guessing it's like the year 2390, something like that, way into the future. And humans have been able to travel into space uh, with, with, with a lot of facility. And basically, there's a planet that they've sent down all the probes. They sent down all the, all the satellites. They, they have a topography of this entire alien planet. They have, uh, like I said, they sent probes. They know exactly what is on this planet. It's got uh, flora and fauna, animals and stuff like that. But they decided never to send a human to set foot on this planet to not, quote unquote, contaminate it, you know, because it's, it's fine. The planet's doing fine by itself. It just didn't need humans, doesn't need humans. The point. The point was, was they sent the, the conceit of the book was the book was a collection of paintings that this gentleman had took from a remote pro, from a probe that floated above the planet. Right. So it, it never it was like a like a giant drone, I guess. Mm. And he was able to move along the planet and paint without disturbing anything. And what was the reason? The reason was we were so far advanced with our technology, right? Our Sony camera, like you just said, right? Mm. We're so far ahead of our technology with our sensors. But what was missing was the human element. Yeah. What was missing was the human subjectivity of what we were looking at and i want to bring that back to this photograph because it's a it's a camera it's a sony it it, it captures you know again the threads in the suit but it takes you justin it takes you the artist the human with your heart and your sensitivity to see what is important and that is your skill because like everything else, there's a lot of noise, right? There's noise everywhere, but what we're always looking for is signal. And what you brought us here, Justin, that I see is you're bringing us pure signal, pure message of what's going on. And that's one thing I find so powerful in your photographs. I'm sorry to kind of steal, you know, steal that from you, but man, I just, I, I just got to let you know how I feel. This is amazing. Let's go to another yeah, that's, photo. Yeah, that's, go. That's, yeah, that's uh, extremely kind of you to say. And one thing that I, yeah, that I do think is, you know, from obviously working and, and being in this environment for so long is that where I feel like, you know, my value is in that area is that, yeah, I, I sort of know where to point. Like I know where things are probably going to happen. And, um, you know, I also have the luxury of, having access to a workspace like this where you know these a unique uh, shot can be made but i also you know understand when to when to point and shoot and and definitely when not to um but uh, um and yet, but yeah and i've been lucky enough to to capture some well, i think some very nice really raw moments that do speak to me and speak to what offshore actually is because the things that we see and I think why it is resonating with some people is that it, these are more real you know like what we get offshore is like a real corporate you know a guy walking down the stairs doing the trailing hand technique with clean cover rules and it's like it's not what it is you know like of oh, an oil rig isn't if you're on a drill floor you're not clean you know, you're sweaty, you're dirty, you've got mud on you, you've got, you know, but they don't show that for some unknown reason. I'm not, I can't figure out why, but um, these shots to me are more real. You know, these are real guys working in the heat, sweaty, dirty, they look tired. Um, yeah, it's it's real. It's real. Yeah. You can't. You cannot take anything away from the expression on these three men faces. This mm. is the photo we're looking at, right? We got one, we got one here in a white hat and we got two green hats. So mm. just silly, silly, silly question. But does green hat in offshore mean the same thing as green hat onshore? Yeah. New. Which is a new, newbie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you got so two newbies we're... here. Go talk to me. Yeah. So we've got, this is like, these are guys on my crew, right? Um, so there is another guy, but he's, he's not in that shot, but we've got like this old 
you know, old salty gentleman. He's been offshore for, I don't know, 30 years or something, you know, done everything. And he's he, he was a case in hand and now he's a, a roughneck. But he's just like an old salty roughneck in his 50s, still roughnecking, uh, goes harder than all the young kid guys, like just doesn't stop all day, always doing something, you know, just a real old school mentality. And then next to him is the polar opposite. He's like brand new, big, like strong kid, real keen, but just, you know, real green, green and keen, good attitude. What we need, you know, definitely we're lacking. The Oilfield Leader Podcast is brought to you by executive producer Daniel Corral, executive producer Jim Lynn, executive producer and voice talent, me, Mad Matt, production assistant, Caleb Knox. The Oilfield Leader Podcast is produced and hosted by Christian Lombardini. Copyright 2024. The Oilfield Leader and Christian Lombardini are rights reserved. Peace.